I'm Ethan Marshall, and today we're going to be taking a little trip with our taste buds to Tuscany. So I decided as a surprise for my partner to create a traditional Tuscan dinner. So in order to do that, we have to go pick up some food that will qualify and some wines that will go great with it. And as the old saying goes, what grows together goes together. So we're going to be looking for Tuscan wines. So quick history lesson. Most people, when they talk about Tuscan wines, are talking about either Chianti or, more likely, uh, Super Tuscans, when they specifically say Tuscany. Um, so there's a little bit of a strange history there, because Chianti is a traditional wine region. There's very strict regulations about what you can call a Chianti. But in Tuscany, for anything that's a Super Tuscan, it's going to be probably labeled as an IGT wine. An IGT is a category that was introduced in 1992, um, by the Italian government that doesn't require them to follow the same regulations as the higher regulated DOC and DOCG categories. And so they can kind of do whatever they want. And how this really got started was by a number of producers, and in particular one who started it all out, that was Sasakaya, who sat there and said, I don't really want to follow the rules. I can only use 70% Sangiovese, so I can't make wines that are 100% and fit in the DOC or DOCG system. And I can't play around with any other varietals like Cabernet or Merlot. And so instead of sitting there and trying to figure out how to make a wine that fit the exact requirements that the Italian government was looking for, he said the hell of it. And he threw it out the window and decided to start making wines anyway and just label them as table wines. Well, eventually the Italian government realized that this wasn't good because those wines started being really, really highly sought after. And suddenly they had wines that were vino de tabla that were more expensive than anything in DOC or DOCG categories in that region. So in order to kind of preserve the validity of their system, as well as some people would argue make a little more money, they decided to create this category in 1992 called IGT. And basically it takes a lot of the rules of table wines from before that where you could have mostly what any varietal you wanted in it, um, you could put a label on it, you had to come from a specific region, and you had to label that on the bottle. Um, so it created another category where it wasn't just a lowly table wine that they were producing anymore, and it also um, freed up a different category where people could go out and look for IGT wine specifically and know that they're getting something that's a little more regulated, probably a little higher in quality, um, than a vino de tavolo. In doing so though, um, they also eventually took away the ability for table wines to be labeled with a vintage. So almost anything that you're going to see that's an Italian um, table wine that's lower than an IGT um, is not going to be very good quality anymore. A lot of those producers have moved into the IGT space because they want to be able to have a vintage on the label and they want to be able to have the freedom to kind of play with what they want. Um, instead of just having to label things table wine and be done with it. Um, so there's very little that's left in that table wine category that's a really good quality product. And so a lot of the great values are now in that IGT category. The biggest things we're looking for are IGT wine from Tuscany, 2010 or 2013, because those are the most recent pretty good vintages. Avoid 2014, it was pretty terrible. Um, you'd be better off with like 2011 or 2012 than you would 2014. Um, and we're going to go take a look and see what we can find. And like I said, also pick up some delicious ingredients to make some amazing dinner. Let's get going. Here, um, there's not a ton to choose from here, but we found one that is a Tuscan blend that's a really neat breakdown. This is a 2013, uh, which is the year we're after, and it is 34% um, Sangiovese, 33% uh, Cab, and 33% Merlot. And in this one, although I said 2012 isn't like the best vintage, it's not a terrible vintage by any means. And um, this one actually got 92 points from James Sutton. So this is one we're going to give a shot and see how it is. And the breakdown on this guy is going to be 90% Sangiovese and 10% Merlot. So it should still be pretty interesting. Um, and I'm excited to uh, see what we end up with here. So let's take it upstairs and see what we've got.
guys, well, I made it back. We've got everything we need here to start on our Tuscan dinner. I'm gonna get these two guys to canting and then show you what I'm making in the kitchen. Let's get started. All right, guys, so we've got a lot of stuff cooking and I wanted to show you what we're gonna do. So for the actual Tuscan meal part of things, what I'm gonna make is a handmade ravioli. Normally that would mean you'd have to pull out your pasta machine and create a dough and run it through and everything, but we're not gonna do any of that today. The trick that I have picked up in order to make the best ravioli um, is actually to go out and buy wonton wrappers. These little square things, you can find them at most grocery stores, um, and they work as perfect ravioli um, wrappers, especially if you're trying to do a Tuscan style. Um, there's a number of regions within Tuscany that are known for much, much larger raviolis that are actually about this size. So you just kind of make a good filling for them, fill them up, and then seal them, and then we'll actually boil them and put them with a different kind of sauce. So the first thing you're going to do is get your two fillings together. Um, I actually have a truffle uh, mushroom cheese mixture over here, and then this one is actually um, chickpea and broccoli rob. So that's going to make a really nice um, vegan um, ravioli too. So we're gonna take these, and then you're gonna take your little wonton wraps, um, or if you wanna you know, make your own, um, that's perfectly fine as well. Take them, kind of separate them out like this, and then we'll start to fill them. So what you wanna do is grab like a spoonful of each filling, not too much, because you don't want it to be over the top. Um, something like this, maybe even a little smaller, I may have to adjust that. Just a little mound in the middle like that. I'm gonna kind of push it out towards the edges. And then you're gonna use some water as a sealing agent right around the edge like this. And then put your second wrapper over the top. And then just kind of press down, sealing the edges. And you wanna make sure you get as much of the bubbles out, uh, air bubbles, I should say, as you go around um, because that could cause the ravioli to burst when you're boiling them. Um, so you kind of have to be careful and you don't wanna boil them on too high of a heat. Um, you wanna bring it up to a rolling boil, kind of salt it, um, and then kind of let it um, come down to um, probably a medium high heat um, to where it's going to keep going, but it's not going to be over the top. So now you've got a perfectly formed, lovely, gigantic ravioli, and we can pop this in the water, and then we'll give it a try with some of our wines over here. <music> So the raviolis are done on the left. We have our uh, truffle cheese and uh, portobello. And then I've done a little bit of uh, olive oil with sauteed garlic, and that's gonna be as close as we have to a sauce. You don't wanna overdress any of these. Um, just kind of make the focus of it, the ravioli and the filling itself. So anything that you're putting on as a sauce, you wanna make sure accompanies it, but doesn't overpower it. And over here, I have a homemade marinara that I've put together on top of our uh, chickpea broccoli rob uh, ravioli. So we're gonna give these both a shot um, with our wines and see if the pairing works. Hopefully it does. All right guys, we're gonna give these wines a shot and then we're gonna dig into these ravioli and see how the pairing works out. So first to start off, we've got the 2013 Barrel. This is a uh, IGT wine from Tuscany. Hopefully they all are. Um, it's the one that was a 34% Sangiovese, 33% Cabernet Sauvignon, 33% Merlot breakdown. Um, so I'm actually pretty excited to give this a shot and see kind of where we're at. Um, yeah, so right away I'm getting a really strong kind of herbal component. There's definitely some cherry, uh, like a black cherry. No, it's more like a sour cherry. No, it's like a black cherry. I take it back. It's like a black cherry with like plum. But there's also an herbal um, component to this, like some maybe some thyme, a little oregano, something like that. Yeah, there's also a nice earthiness to the nose too. It's, it's really neat. Let's give it a whirl. Yeah, this still is um, opening up actually. You definitely get some oak. Um, some good tannins. Um, it has a pretty good lingering finish, but the oak is really, really strong on this. Um, like really a little more intense than I was kind of hoping for initially. Let's give it another shot though. No, I mean, there's some, 
And there's some black cherry coming through um, on the palate. But I was really looking forward to a lot of those herbal notes I was getting on the nose. Um, and I'm getting less of those on the palate um, than I was expecting. So, I mean, not bad for the price point that we're talking about, um, at, but not the most incredible Super Tuscan that I've had at the 20 to 15 to $20 price point. So the next one we're gonna try is this Villa Puccini Toscana. Um, this is 2012. And this one is 90% Sangiovese, 10% Merlot. Supposedly it got uh, 92 points from James Suckling. So I really am interested to see, because this is about the same price point as that other one. Um, I'm very interested to see how that, um, how that translates uh, in the wine, if, if that is accurate. Um, so right away, I don't know how well you can see it here, but this one is definitely um, a lot lighter in color. Um, and much less opaque than the last one, which makes sense because we're talking about mostly Cabernet Merlot over here, and here we're talking 90% Sangiovese. So we're gonna get a little lighter. Oh, this is really nice, actually. This is really good. I can kind of see, well, let me reserve judgment for the palate, but um, there's some really um, good funkiness, some kind of like dirt and earth. I definitely get some strong like rosemary and like time. Um, wow, that's really nice. It's almost, it's got a hint, just a tiny hint of like a, a barnyardy kind of thing going on. Yeah, this is actually really nice. And there is some cherry. Um, but the fruit, it definitely takes a, a back seat to some of the other things going on, but really interesting mix. Give it a whirl. Yeah, really good structure. Um, it, it has a good lingering finish that's still kind of going on for me. Um, definitely a lot of black cherry. I got a hint of like raspberry um, as well, but just a hint, um, but a very dry raspberry, kind of like an underripe raspberry. Um, yeah, there's a hint of some cocoa as well, which is coming through really well. Um, and then those herbal components are coming through. I'm definitely getting some of that rosemary, a little thyme, um, really, really nicely put together. Um, for, for the price point, this is definitely my favorite of the two. I'm very interested to see what my partner thinks of them. Um, but this would definitely be the one I would go out and pick up. So this is Villa Puccini Toscana 2012 really surprised at that for the price point. This is, this is the kind of thing that you um, really look for here uh, and get excited about because for that price point, uh, for a, a wine that come from Tuscany and um, with all the history and everything there with a lot of super Tuscans, this is, um, this is really good. This is an interesting producer. I'm actually pretty excited about that. Um, so let's give the food a try with it and make sure that we're good. First, we're gonna start off with our truffled uh, ravioli here. See, that's absolutely perfect with this one. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. God, the herbal part is just so really, really nice. All right, let's give it a shot with the other wine. Give it a fair shot because maybe it's not the best wine on its own, but it's an amazing food pairing wine. You never know. Um, there's definitely some that I run into that are like that. I'm gonna turn it really good. And by the way, I didn't use a truffle cheese. I just used truffle um, salt with it when I cooked the mushrooms and then also when I made the filling mixture. Turned out really good. Yeah, I mean, this one has some more kind of plummy notes. It's a little rounder. Um, it's good, it still pairs with it. Um, but it's not as nice as this. All right, let's try our vegan option here. 
our chickpea broccoli rabe with a marinara, which by the way, I'll link up the recipe to below. It's not my marinara, it's not my recipe. Um, I just made the thing. That pairs really, really well. The acidity in the tomato um, brings out a little more of the tannins. So if you're somebody who is um, very tannic phobic, um, that's probably not the best pairing. Um, but if you're okay with the tannins, it's really nice because it accents the wine very well and brings out even more um, positive qualities of it. See, actually, that makes me like this wine um, more than I liked it before. Um, I, I like both of these with that one um, very nearly equally, but this is a better wine with this than it is on its own. Um, so if this one sounds like it appeals more um, and it's less vegetal, it's, um, it's a little more fruit driven, um, then this is probably a good one. But pair it with something with a marinara because it's going to really bring out the best properties in it. Um, I was really impressed. So overall though, very happy with how it turned out. This is the clear winner to me. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it really, it kind of surprised me. I actually figured the opposite would be the case, but yeah, definitely that's the winner. No questions. For me, just on the wine part of things, this is the clear winner, the Villa Puccini uh, 2012. So. You know, I was going out trying to look for 2013s and we ended up with the 2012 anyway, and um, it's a good thing that we did. So um, that's all we have for today. I'm going to go cook the rest of these raviolis and settle in for an awesome dinner. I'll catch up with you guys later in the week. I hope you have a good start to things. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>